we're going to continue our discussion of the emergence of Christianity in the early, uh, or early Christianity in the Roman Empire. Uh, we've talked about literal and figurative language. Uh, we've talked about early Christian institutions. Here I'm going to take a few moments and talk about the Gnostic Gospels. We'll print this for you so you can see the word is Greek and it pertains to knowledge, uh, knowing, Gnosticism. Uh, agnostic, you've all heard this word. The A is the negation. Uh, agnostic, not knowing. Uh, context. I think the best context for the Gnostic Gospels is uh, the creation of a Christian orthodoxy within the Roman Empire. Uh, the Gnostic Gospels demonstrate great diversity in the early faith. And we will see later when we talk about the Council of Nicaea in 325 of the Common Era, the reduction of this diversity to a Christian orthodoxy or the right way to think. Uh, orthodoxy is a word you've all heard. I don't know if you know the meaning. It's from the Greek as well. It means straight thinking. In the context of religious studies, it means uh, believing in the correct thing. Uh, you've, heard of an, you've heard of an orthodontist, straight teeth, well, orthodoxy, straight thinking. Uh, the significance of these Gnostic Gospels, uh, like I said, is uh, primarily they demonstrate a remarkable diversity in early Christianity. Before there was uh, the canonization of Scripture, a Bible, before there was uh, a Christian creed, which is created at Nicaea, and we'll talk about that later. Gnosis, like I said, uh, equals knowledge. Here, it's not so much belief or faith uh, that guarantees salvation as it is uh, knowledge, of secret rituals, secret knowledge pertaining to redemption and salvation. The Gnostic Gospels um, emerge here in modernity uh, at the end of the Second World War. Uh, at a place in Egypt, uh, Nag Hammadi, and, and you can Google this, we'll show you the word. Uh, here I believe some Egyptian farmers were searching for uh, fertilizer and came across uh, these Gnostic Gospels, these scrolls that were contained in a ceramic vase of some sort. Um, once these reached uh, the academic level, uh, theologians and scholars uh, understood their significance and as these began to be translated, it was obvious that there was a remarkable, remarkable early uh, diversity in the Christian faith. And uh, we have uh, whole collections of these. Quite often they're simply called the, the Nag Hammadi Library. Uh, you can Google that. You can Google Gnostic Gospels. Uh, these are all available online. You can read them. Uh, they're collected in books at the bookstore or the library if you want to take a look at them. Uh, a number of them are quite famous. The Gospel of Thomas, the Infancy Gospel of Jesus, uh, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, which presents us with a, an entirely new version of that story. Uh, there's even the Gospel of Judas that um, uh, profoundly contradicts um, the depiction of Judas that we get uh, in the Synoptic Gospels in the New Testament. Uh, in the Gnostic Gospels, Quite often, the individual and the divine intermingle, and this, of course, is um, most unorthodox in uh, modern Christianity, where the divine is quite separate from the individual. Dualism often prevails in the Gnostic Gospels, this notion of the material world being evil, uh, the spiritual world being virtuous. I want to give you uh, a couple of examples of uh, early uh, Gnostic beliefs and practices. Uh, the first is from a very interesting early Christian leader, I believe of the second century of the Common Era, uh, Marcion. Uh, he had followers, the Marcionite Christians. Uh, Marcion made uh, a very powerful argument, quite controversial, and most unorthodox, as would later be determined at Nicaea uh, by the Christian bishops. Marcion argued that Jesus was fully divine and did not die on the cross. After all, how could a god allow himself to be executed as a common criminal? Uh, this points to the, uh, the fact that Christianity is, if nothing else, the most ironic of major faiths. You don't expect the deity to be executed as a, a common criminal. 
Marcion said uh, that Jesus and Yahweh uh, uh, have no connection to each other, have no relationship. Of course, Orthodox Christianity says that they are one and the same. Or uh, quite often, Yahweh is referred to as the Father, and Jesus is referred to as the Son. Uh, Marcion contradicts this and says that uh, they have no connection. And his argument is interesting. You can actually uh, take a look at this argument on your own if you're interested in this type of, uh, in this topic. Um, what Marcion did was to go through the Old Testament and examine the character and actions of the Jewish God, Yahweh. And from Marcion's analysis, it appears that Yahweh is a small local war God of the Israelites, not a universal God of love and peace as Jesus is depicted, but instead a, um, uh, a murderous and tyrannical God. Um, you can look at this, uh, if you have a concordance, uh, I know I use the, the Strong's concordance, and you can uh, look up the verb uh, to smite, for instance. And uh, the concordance will give you chapter and verse, book, chapter and verse, uh, all through the Bible where you will find that expression, to smite. And if you do that, you will find a remarkable uh, number of uh, nations and peoples that the, Isra is the God of the Israelites, Yahweh, smites, that is destroys, uh, for specifically his people, the chosen people, the Israelites. Marcion makes the argument that this is a war god of the Israelites and he cannot have uh, a relationship with Jesus who is completely opposite. If Yahweh is exclusive, Jesus is inclusive. If Yahweh is a war god, Jesus is a god of peace. So you can see Marcion's argument here. Of course, it was uh, disavowed by the Christian bishops at Nicaea. There's another uh, Gnostic group, and again, I'm just giving you two examples. There are many, many, many others. Uh, the Ebionites, and again, we'll give you uh, the spelling of this. The Ebionites argued that Jesus was fully human and did die on the cross. Uh, he's fully human in the Ebionites' view because the Messiah would not be executed as, uh, as a common criminal. Um, so he had to be, therefore, fully human and not divine. So you can see there's just a remarkable uh, number of arguments and, and diversity in the early faith. Uh, in conclusion, I'll, I'll state that, uh, again, we'll talk about the Council of Nicaea in a couple of lectures. Here, uh, in 325 of the Common Era, the Emperor Constantine will gather the Christian bishops at Nicaea uh, on the Black Sea in what we think of today as modern-day Turkey. And there, these, this early Christian diversity will be eliminated and uh, a Christian orthodoxy will emerge uh, with the canonization of Scripture and the emergence of the first Bibles. Um, so I'm going to end it there, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.